the the election will be held by Caroline and Salvatore, and the name of the lecture is multiplication of the bad sides, impact of painting for sites. Please. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your kind of introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As it was already mentioned, my name is Carolina Salvadori. I am a PhD student, and today I would like to tell you some words about the part of my thesis. And this presentation would be dedicated to the Urea Binding Unit, which we try to attach from a suitable carrier to prepare a receptive material suitable for binding phosphate. Before I start with my own results, I would like to tell you some words about our motivation and maybe inspiration, because the main aim of my work is to prepare the receptor with a suitable selectivity towards phosphate. And although we know that these anions mature across the nature, however, their distribution is highly dependent on human activities. We all know that these anions are used in a form of chemical fertilizer to improve the growth of our plants. However, if you ever ask yourself, what happened with these nutrients if they aren't fully utilized by these plants? And of course, they could be lost from farmers' field and then could have some negative impact on the quality of water. Like you can see here in those pictures where eutrophication is detected and it's a serious environmental problem. And we have also another target in our work because every year, numerous of highly efficient receptors are produced, but their real life application are usually low, and it is due to a complicated manipulation with them and also an ability to reuse them. So now today I would like to show you how we try to overcome such a problem. <laughs> so for today I have prepared a presentation with these three main points. I would like to start with the synthesis and the determination of binding efficiency of the prepared urea binding unit. Then I would like to tell you how we try to attach it on a surface of several carboxylone carrier. And the last point of this presentation will be dedicated to the comparison of monomer and dendritic branch structures. So here in this scheme, we can see the synthesis of the binding unit. As you can see, it's very simple. It includes only four steps. Here we started with methyl amine, which reacts with other substituted methyl chloride. Then the sulfur amidic hydrogen was substituted by the radio via alkylation, and in the next step, the nitro group was reduced, and the octane amino derivative reacted in the final step with phenyl isocyanate when the urea binding site is created. So, here again, we can see a general structure of the prepared binding unit. And now, let's discuss it more in details. So, I already mentioned that there is a urea binding site suitable to anion coordination. To improve its hydrogen bond donating ability, there is sulfon emetic electron withdrawal unit. And here I would like to only mention that the sulfon emetic hydrogen was substituted by the to exclude its possible deprotonation during the condensation process. And the last part of these molecules, which I would like to highlight, is a triple bond here, which is suitable to encourage the binding unit to a zero carrier. So after the successful synthesis, we started to determine the binding efficiency. And we have used proton NMR and UV by titration experiments with a series of anion in the form of tetrabutyl ammonium salt. And some of them are summarized here in the paper. And we can see a considerable selectivity and binding efficiency towards phosphate, which are represented here by monobasic phosphate. So, after the synthesis and determination of binding preferences, we were quite satisfied, but we tried to approach to attach the binding unit on a suitable carrier. And here I would like to acknowledge Dr. Tomasz Strashak and his research group because they have prepared for us four different carboxylan carrier bearing one, two, four, or even eight as a group. So, by utilizing click reaction, we have ensured our binding unit to this carrier uh, in the presence of cuprum iodide as a catalyst. So we have prepared four different receptors: monomer five, bivalent receptor six, and two dendrimer. Dendrimer of the first generation 
to which correspond to number seven, and number eight, which correspond to the gender of the second generation. Then we proceed to some preliminary experiments. And it seems that bivalent receptor six form self aggregates into a solution. So for further discussion, I will focus my attention only to monorail five and both dendrimer. <sighs> so before I start with the comparison of branch dendritic structures and a monomer, I have to tell you that for high stoichiometry, there is no mathematical tool to analyze the binding efficiency. So uh, because we haven't got a tool which should analyze the data obtained from measurements, but nevertheless, we started to analyze the progress of the complexation by analyzing complexation induced chip. Because we could imagine that when it got a solution of receptor and we put there an anion, the complexation leads to the modification of electron density on the binding side and its nearest surrounding. But what we have found for branched dendritic structures was quite a curious because not only protons from urea hydrogen uh, shifted and the nearest one, but also protons which correspond to the proximity of triazol change their position. On the other hand, at the same experiments done with the monomer, the, these protons were on a fixed position. So it seems strange, but the answer to explain this phenomena was quite a simple because carbocyl and dendrimer carrier are quite flexible. So if we put small amount of phosphate, they could cooperate together. We have also done these studies by using another anion. We have chosen spherical anion chloride, but no similar effect has been obtained. So as I mentioned, we weren't able to obtain, however, the value of association constant for the dendrimer, but we desired to compare it by monomer. And for this reason, oops, sorry, uh, we have started to investigate so-called competitive measurements. From this graph, we can see two curves. First one, pink, correspond to the monomer to which defined equivalent of monobasic phosphate were added. And we can see a typical hyperbolic curve during the titration. And then we have prepared a solution where not only monomer, but also the dendrimer was present. And let's say that in a theoretical same equivalence of phosphate, added for the monomer unit were added in a solution, it seems that the complexation shift wasn't so pronounced. And it was due to that this phosphate were consumed by the dendrimer, which seems to be more efficient than the monomer receptor. So at a high concentration of phosphate, then uh, the branches of dendrimer could act independently, and the effect of monomer and dendrimer would be then practically the same. And we have also another advantage, which coming from the large size of dendrimer, and here I would like to acknowledge Dr. Krupkova for her work, because she did for us recycling of the dendrimer via nanofiltration, which is a really sympathetic method. We have a solution of the complex. We put there a small amount of methanol, which uh, lowered the density of the solution as well, destabilized the complex. And by using nitrogen pressure uh, to a maternal liquid, uh, we could filtrate it through nanofiltration membrane. And the recycling efficiency is around 70%, which is really nice number. So ladies and gentlemen, because I think that my time is nearly approaching to the end, so I would like to conclude. So today I told you something about the preparation of easy urea binding motif, its attachment to several carrier. But the take home message from this presentation is that the carrier should improve our, uh, our binding ability as well as uh, should be useful for us for further recycling of the receptor. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. I would like to also acknowledge my fantastic supervisor, Professor Pavel Matejka, as well as my brilliant supervising expert, Dr. Petra Cuzinjava and Professor And now I think it's time for your questions. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, 
And now we have time for one question. When you showed us the, the <coughs> competitive studies, mm -hmm. was it the first dendrimer or the second one? Uh, it was a uh, dendrimer of the second generation. Both of these dendrimer have the same behavior, but let's say that for the dendrimer of the second generation, uh, the effect is more pronounced. Okay. Thank you very much for your really nice question. <laughs> so, thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> The next presentation will be held by Lenka Suchankova. She will present it seven field based characterization of aerosol light scattering of these at Central European University. Thanks a lot. Good morning, dear committee, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here and present you part of my PhD thesis, which is based on the measurement, long-term measurement of aerosol light scattering properties at Central European rural site with a special focus on variability and source apportionment. I'm supervised by Dr. Vladimir Dimal and Professor Ivan Holovek, and I'm collaborating both with ICTF and Czech Law, Global Change Research Institute in Berlin. I'm going to talk about aerosols and their effect on climate. We will talk about their optical properties and climate relevant variables. I will show you methods and my experimental design, and of course, some results which have been obtained so far, and some future plans. When you look at this slide, you can see different natural and anthropological phenomena, sea spray, sandstorm, spray, fog, colon, or industry. Is there anything what could connect all these variety of phenomena? Of course there is, because otherwise I wouldn't ask. It's aerosol. Aerosol is either produced by this phenomena or our phenomenon itself. Aerosols are suspended liquid or solid particles in a gas, and their size range from one nanometer to 100 micrometer. And due to this wide variety of sizes, we can expect different chemical, physical, or biological properties. They are important because they highly influence human health, climate, visibility, and hydrologic cycle. If there are no aerosols in the atmosphere, we have no clouds, no rain, and thus no hydrologic cycle. Now let's talk about aerosols and climate. Here you can see four different scenarios. In the first one, we can assume we have low concentrations of aerosol, but enough to produce cloud. Incoming solar radiation can either scatter on the cloud, could be absorbed in the cloud, or can go through and reach Earth's surface. If the concentration increases, we can observe so-called direct effect, which consists of scattering of light and absorption of light by aerosols. But as you can see, scattering is more dominant, and thus the whole direct effect is predominantly cooling. And then we have two, then we have indirect effect consisting of two types. The first indirect effect is connected to increased concentration of cloud droplets and thus bigger cloud albedo. And in the second indirect effect, we can observe lower precipitation rate, increased height of cloud as well as lifetime of cloud. So to sum it up, aerosols cool our climate and they can cause slower global warming. However, report from IPCC uh, from 2021 shows that aerosols, the properties and behaviors still remain one of the biggest uncertainties in climate model estimation. And what's more, we are also lacking long-term measurements. And that's my objective is, what is the seven years based characterization of aerosol light scattering properties at Central European Rural site? What's the variability and source of portion? Here you can see my experimental design. Uh, the long term measurement were provided 
in National Atmospheric Observatory Kosciewice in the Sacina region. And we were measuring with integrated metallometer equipped with the sampling head B and 10. This instrument is measuring scattering of light by uh, aerosols at three different wavelengths, red, green, and blue. This instrument is measuring so-called total scattering coefficient, which characterizes uh, the light which is scattered in any angle of, this, of the particle, and backscattering coefficient, which characterizes the light which is scattered in 90 degrees and more back, let's say, to the space. And together, we can assume that we can characterize direct pulling effect of aerosols on the climate. Statistical analysis was provided by our software program. And as any instrument, nephelometer is not perfect. And thus, we had to correct our data for non-ideal illumination, transmutation of light source, standard pressure and temperature to be able to compare it with other stations. And because relative humidity highly influenced aerosol properties, we had to keep it under 40% during the measurements. Here are Another very, other very important climate relevant variables. Scattering angstrom exponent, which characterizes particle size dependence on the wavelength of light, then single scattering albedo is the ratio of scattering to the total extinction of radiation. Extinction is the sum of scattering and absorption of light by aerosols. Hemispheric backscattering ratio can estimate aerosol cooling caused by, uh, sorry, atmospheric cooling caused by aerosols. An asymmetric factor is the amount of radiation that is scattered by the particle in the forward direction compared to the backward direction. If the scattering is total back, we can have minus value minus one. And if it's completely forward scattering, we have a volume number one. And let's check some results. In the first graph, you can see two lines. The first line is for total scattering coefficient, and the second line is for back scattering coefficient. You can see annual variations from 2012 to 2019. And as you can see, in all the cases, we can, uh, we can see a decreasing trend. And it is also proved by this table where slopes of uh, different variables per year are shown both the mean and the median. In the graph below, we have annual variation of angstrom exponent. It's also decreasing, but what does it tell to us? It means that the size of particles in is increasing from 2012 to 2019 at our observatory. And the last graph, backscattering ratio is increasing and this suggesting increasing backscattering potential and bigger cooling effect or by aerosols in Kosciuszko. In the first slide, you can see seasonal variations. The first graph seasonal variation of angstrom exponent is increased in winter. It means that we have smaller particles in, in summer, uh, sorry, increased angstrom exponent in summer, which, uh, which indicate smaller particles in summer, and thus we can expect secondary organic aerosol formation. On the other hand, decreased exponent in winter can be caused by aerosol aging and bigger atmospheric stability in this, in this season. In the second graph, you can see asymmetric factor, which is decreased in summer, indicating more effective cooling during summer than during winter. An increased asymmetric factor in winter can, I, uh, can indicate increased concentration of carbonaceous aerosols, which are species who are absorbing uh, light better than scattering. And of course, the sources are mainly residential heatings. Here you can see diurnal and weekly variations of total scattering coefficient. And as you can see, uh, the diurnal variation is similar for all the days during the week and we can observe morning and evening peak in each day. And for the week, maximum could be observed through uh, the middle of the week and continue to the rest of the second part of the week. I also checked uh, the influence of cloudiness on scattering properties, as you can see in this slide, and we characterized four categories 
days which are overcast, cloudy, partly cloudy, and fine. These categories are based on the recommendations of our World Meteorological Organization. And we found out that increased backscattering ratio, which is the y-axis, was during fine and overcast days, so our extremes. Here in this figure, you can see, uh, you can see the impact of fog on scattering properties. Uh, fog is uh, written here for uh, separate wavelengths. And we also found out that there is decreased backscattering ratio during fog events, which means that our atmosphere is cooling by aerosols lower during fog events. Here is uh, the example of our source apportionment where we use potential source contribution function. How it works? Uh, we can ask, what's the probability that our measured value, in this case, its total scattering coefficient, is higher than 75 percentile if the air masses are transported at uh, or through the certain grids. Grids are these small, uh, small squares on, on the map. In, in this place. And as you can see, it was easier for us to, let's say, identify the sources in the winter season because we had higher values of scattering during the winter. For my future plans, I would like to uh, check the relationship of scattering properties and size distribution of particles, other meteorological conditions, chemical composition, mainly uh, organic carbon, I would like to calculate full radiative forcing for our observatory in Kosciuszce, and of course also atmospheric conditions, mainly influence of height of planetary boundary layer. This work and much more have already been presented in the first Actree Science Conference as a poster and will be presented uh, in uh, International Aerosol Conference in Greece, Kovaditis conference in Dr. Karlovice, and also annual conference on the Czech Aero Society in Nahoya. Thank you for your attention and don't hesitate to ask questions. Thank you so much. Uh, my question will be probably a bit naive, but does that mean that? Uh, the aerosols are increasing in size as a sort of a self-regulating mechanism of the climate, or how do you explain that, that in fact, over the years, the, 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 the aerosols increase in size, like, like you described? That's a great question. Thanks a lot. Uh, of course, it's just my hypothesis so far, but, uh, you know, when the small particles are produced, they are, mm, or at least, uh, at Kosciuszce, you know that Kosciuszce is in Vysočina, and Vysočina is mainly agricultural uh, agricultural region, and small particles are produced by burning, heating, and, and all that stuff. And my hypothesis is that there are stricter, stricter rules for air policies, or for air pollution. And uh, the seven years, I think there are enough time to really see the shift that, for example, people are not burning anything they want, or they are using more, uh, for example, gas or something like that, like the shift also in energetic uh, industry here. And uh, thus we have some less small particles and we could have bigger particles from uh, other sources or also these bigger particles could be produced by accumulation of these small particles. And because we don't have fresh, uh, or we have lower rate of fresh emitting of small particles, they have enough time to accumulate together and be bigger. Thank you. <coughs> Can you explain why you presented the peak in the middle of the peak? Sorry. It was a graphic of weekly trend. Mm -hmm. And you have the peak in the middle of the week. Yes. Why? Can you explain it? Is it is it stressful? Actually, that's also a good question because when I was uh, thinking about the morning and evening peak during the, the day, 
Uh, I was thinking about morning and evening peak also uh, connected to uh, fossil fuel combustion because people are traveling to work and back to work, back, back from work, sorry. Uh, but uh, when it comes to weekly variation, I think it must be connected somehow to the weekend. Like that people, people have to produce more uh, to, uh, during the weekend and then it's, uh, it's uh, decreasing to, to the Monday. But uh, I'm still in, in the region of examining of this trend. Thank you. So thank you very much for the presentation. Presentation for this section will be presented by Ajal Laha, and the presentation named Vertical Distribution of Black Carbon Earth. Good morning, everyone. I am Kajal Zulaha. I'm, uh, I will be presenting today the vertical distribution of black carbon energy. Uh, this is the outline of my today's presentation. I will introduce you uh, with the black carbon aerosols, its climatic impacts, and why we need vertical profiling of this black carbon aerosol, and what are the different methods of uh, vertical profiling. And there's a drone measurement, which was a test for my PhD thesis and what are the future requirements at the end? Black carbon aerosols. And now you're familiar with the aerosols as Ms. Lenka introduced you with the aerosols. Black carbon aerosol is one of the type of the aerosols and it is also known as suit. And it lies in the, uh, in the category of PM 2.5. That is its size range is less than equal to 2.5 micrometers. And its main sources are anthropogenic, like fossil fuel burning and biomass burning. And it is highly absorbing aerosols. It can absorb in the range of visible to infrared spectrum. And uh, it is also known as the second most uh, contributor to the global warming because it is highly absorbing and it warms the environment. As it warms the environment, it also offsets the cooling effect of various other aerosols, which can scatter the light and can give you the cooling effect. And uh, indirect radiative forcing is that it can also act as a cloud condensation nuclei that, uh, that is water vapors can grow on these aerosols and can interact with the clouds and change its properties. Another is that it lies in the sub, sub micro range of the uh, size that is the size is too low for the gravitational set settling. That's why it can be important to the long range areas. And what are the major sources of the black carbon aerosol? First is up in burning, that is uh, burning of the crops after the harvesting. And second is diesel emissions, traffic emissions, which can be diesel and petrol both. And this is solid fuel burning, which can be for the cooking, maybe the barbecue fuels. <laughs> and another one is marine emissions, emissions from the ships. Um, and uh, this is one of the major source for the uh, black carbon aerosols in industrial emission. Second one is biomass burning, that is uh, use of uh, the wood and the cow dung stand for the cooking. This is like very common in India. Uh, but different climatic effects of black carbon. We have three different types of uh, climatic effects that is direct, semi indirect, and uh, indirect. Semi, uh, this is the direct effect of black carbon aerosols that is, it can absorb the solar radiations coming towards it and can warm the environment directly. Another is I mean, semi direct impact of the black carbon aerosol, that is how it, how it interacts with the clouds when it is below, above, or near the cloud. When it is below the cloud, uh, it can enhance the convection, that is, uh, it can increase the uh, evaporation from the surface and can lead to the cloud increase. 
when it is near the cloud and it depends on the altitude because at a higher altitude, the black carbon aerosol are highly absorbing because of the low dense air or because of the high induction flux. And uh, uh, when it is near the clouds, it uh, obviously warms the environment and leads to the cloud, inter cloud reduction. But the radiative forces impact is at the lower, at the higher altitude, the radiative forcing is negative. And at the high, mid altitudes or low altitude, the radiative forcing imposed is positive. Another is uh, when uh, these aerosols are above the clouds, it depends on the region. When we are in convergent region, it uh, enhances the convection um, because it enhances the con low level convergence uh, and it uh, increases the evaporation from the surface and we have more moisture. Uh, in the downwater region, it depends on which type of clouds we, uh, it is interacting with. If we have cumulus clouds, then it leads to the cloud reduction. If we have starocumulus uh, clouds, it leads to the cloud um, increase. Another is indirect in phase. Um, first, uh, this is the clouds with the droplets here. When aerosols, when these black carbon aerosols interact with the clouds, the, the size of the droplets in the cloud uh, decreases, but the water content remains the same. And this is also known as the first indirect effect. Then we have second indirect effect when when these like this suppresses the drizzles, so it increases the liquid water content in the clouds, and uh, it also increases the height of the clouds because it is a warming aerosol, so uh, it uh, converts the water vapor content in the clouds because of evaporation, and it also increases the lifetime of the clouds in our atmosphere, and these aerosols can also interact with the ice and the ice in the Contrails, ice clouds, which is also known as contrails. Then why we need vertical profiling? Because uh, we need to quantify the effect of uh, radiative forcing. Sorry. Because we need to quantify the effect of black carbon aerosols on the radiative forcing and the clouds and, and its interaction with the boundary layer. Because, because of these warming effects, it can highly impose the positive radiative forcing most, and it can also interact with the clouds and the boundary layer as well. Like it can affect the evolution of the boundary layer effectively. And then another is that we have high uncertainty in the modeling of the black carbon aerosol, in the modeling of the vertical distribution of the black carbon aerosol, because we don't have enough data and we are just assuming in the modeling. So it produces the high uncertainty. And uh, some researchers have even showed that it produces, produces the uncertainty of more than 25% in the model. Another is that uh, uh, in the different height, the black carbon aerosols produces different radiative forcing, different, it can be positive or can be negative. So we need the actual information of the black carbon aerosols at the different heights. So that's why we need to measure uh, the vertical profiling. And there is very limited information available right now for the vertical profiling of these aerosols. Almost no studies are in the Czech Republic. Uh, these are the different methods how you can measure the black carbon aerosols. But as uh, this aircraft may be using the drone and some fixed wing rotators, hexarotators, and different types of rotators. And second one is the data balloons we can use to measure the vertical distribution of the aerosols. But Another is meteorological towers we can use, and we can measure at the different heights for the long, for the long term measurements. First is stable balloons. Uh, there are two types of balloons available. One is zero pressure balloon, which can stay for some few days at a particular height. And then we have uh, the super pressure balloon, which can stay at a particular altitude up to the six months. And this super pressure balloon is, test, is also tested by the NASA, and it can stay uh, up to six months with a lower payload, and it can take the payload of up to three cars, that is 3,600 kilograms. And these are also known as scientific balloons. Another is meteorological towers. There are almost 20 towers um, around the world. And we have one tower at, the, at our, our 
observatory that is National Observatory at Kashukutse. And uh, this uh, is 230 meters long, and currently it is measuring at 4 meters, 50 meters, 80 meters, 125 meters, and 230 meters. Okay. And uh, this is a part of various national and international projects as well, that like integrated um, carbon observation system, uh, which have almost like 140 stations around 14 European countries and measuring the greenhouse gases. These are air vehicles, which is also known as unmanned air vehicles, because we can just, uh, we, didn't, we, don't, we don't need to sit on these airplanes and go for the measurements. So that's why this is also called the unmanned air vehicles. And uh, these are very versatile as compared to the other language measure, measurements for the vertical profiling. And these are also can be reduced curves as compared to the others, like, like the other measuring, measuring devices like leader and other. And these are the some comparison with the different type of uh, the air vehicles. This is fixed ring, rupture ring, and unmanned air vehicles, uh, which are like highly professional. You can you can uh, remotely plot it. Like you can give uh, this air, air vehicles the uh, like you can program it. I don't know much about programming, but you can program how you want to do it and how long you want to do it. And this can hover at one place, and but these uh, uh, got the high speed. You cannot, uh, like it got the minimum speed. You cannot give it the minimum speed. It got some five meter per second, and it cannot go uh, below that. But for the rotary ring, you can have low speed, which is one meter per second as well. And these are not so costly. That's why I'm using these rotary wings uh, for my measurements. This is my first test measurement just to see how good data I can get from the first drone measurements. And I tested it with the two types. First, I, I have these inlets out, like it is maybe 10 meters up to the drone. And then I use 2.5 meter of the string uh, to measure the data. And uh, so my measurement site was uh, National Observatory at the Kashukitse, National Atmospheric Observatory at Kashukitse. And it represents a ruler background stripe in the center of Europe. And uh, this. Uh, this, is, uh, this site is dominant by the Western winds, so we can have long range transport of the black carbon aerosols as well. And it, is, uh, it also represents the uh, regional and long, long range transport of air masses as well. And this is the tower, um, and I measured uh, around 100 meters away along this, row, uh, this tower. What I use is micro ethnometer A51, which measures a uh, different, um, sorry, <laughs> which goes the high resolution, which can be like one second and other as well. And it goes the, you can also alter the, uh, the flow rate for it. And uh, what I used was 150 liters per minute. And it measures the aerosols based on the attenuation, like, uh, uh, it measures the, uh, the air, it collects the aerosols on a filter and it passes a light of 880 nanometers through it and it measures the attenuation. Through the attenuation, uh, using some mathematical calculation, you can uh, get the mass uh, of the black carbon aerosols. And uh, what are my results with that? Uh, when I used the string, the data was highly noisy, it was not stable. But when I used the, this inlet on the drone, like 10 meters up on the drone, the data was highly stable. And this is my raw data because I was hovering at some places while coming down. So it is a bit noisy while coming down. Blue one rep represents the line when we go up and uh, the red line represents when we go down with the drone. And what are the key results? Sorry, yeah, okay. The key results were that the data was not good with the, this and but I found that uh, after the me 50 meters the data was increasing and after 50 to 180 meters it was highly stable and after 180 meters it was it increased as well 
that can be because of the presence of the clouds and at the low level clouds. And, or maybe we can have a boundary layer below because of the presence of the cloud. And this is uh, the box plot to know how good was my data and the outliers are very low, low for, uh, for every height. So the data measure, measured by the instrument was very, uh, highly stable and is in good quality. And another thing I noticed is that um, uh, the, aer the aerosols at the, at the four meters, this is, was very low, but at the 50 meters, it was highly uh, uh, elevated. Like it was uh, increased by the factor of one, uh, one, micrometer, one micrograms. And this is very unusual because uh, this is a high increase from four meters to 50 meters. And that can be because we, we were measuring during the noon, and it can be because of the strong vertical mixing during the noon time, because uh, we have a highly elevated boundary layer during the noon. Um, these are some of my future refinements, and this is like I will be hovering more to the different heights, and I will be using silica gel. And to complete the picture, I will compare my measurements with the different devices like LIDAR and uh, other oscillometer. And we are also having pendulous and photometer coming soon. Oh, that's all. So, time is all done. So, thank you. It's time for the one question. Hi, I'm, I'm just a bit curious. Do you think from the vertical height situation alone, we can uh, identify some sources, uh, whether or not you can tell if it's a local source or whether it has kind of transboundary? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, long range transported air is highly aged and it is fully modified. So we can identify that. And from the local sources, it must be like fresh or something not highly growth in the age. Okay, so thank you for your contribution. Thank <laughs> you.